that we will follow. Hello and welcome to Trinity Talk Live, water cooler conversation from a Christian perspective. Sometimes one of the most amusing things about doing this show is what happens off camera right before we start uh, the show. <laughs> so that's for us to know and you not to. Um, so. Until the blooper episode comes out. <laughs> I don't keep. I don't have enough room to keep all the footage. <laughs> sorry. So anyway, um, welcome to Trinity Talk Live. Uh, I am joined again here today by Pastoral Assistant Ben Lander. Say hi, Ben. Hi, Ben. It's same joke he made last time. It's amazing. <laughs> it's somehow just funnier Never this time. Never gets no. old. Okay. Um, so happy almost tax day, everybody. Um, this is there's something you probably didn't expect to hear from a uh, <laughs> from a, a Christian themed show. Mm. We're going to be talking about taxes. This is not the IRS website or YouTube channel you've gotten <laughs> onto today. It is the Trinity Joppa channel, but we're going to talk about taxes because as of the date this is airing, um, taxes are due in six days. So if you haven't filed your taxes yet, get on that. My, now might be the time mm. or. Sunday at midnight might be the time. <laughs> so they're due by Monday. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so um, anyway, but it occurred to me as I was, uh, you know, Ben and I did an episode a few weeks ago. We were getting ready for that on um, so long ago. What was that one? <laughs> Should we celebrate Easter? Easter, yeah, we did an Easter episode um, which, a little while ago, and uh, in, in the lead up to that, I kind of was looking for you know the shows we were going to do in in April. And it occurred, I saw tax day on the calendar, and I said, hey, there's a very famous Bible passage about taxes. Maybe we could do an episode about taxes. And I pitched it to Ben. He thought it would be a good idea. Um, and so knowing that I had a residential theological expert on board, we said, let's run with it. <laughs> so, more so than me. So we are, um, we're, we're kind of titling this episode, What Does Render Unto Caesar Mean? And, um, and we're going to talk about that a little bit, about the interplay between our faith and our and taxes and paying taxes to the government authorities. So to start things off with, I'm going to go ahead and read the passage um, so that people that you know maybe aren't familiar with it, or just to have it fresh in your mind as we're going to get restarted, we're going to read it. And I'm reading it from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, uh, starting in verse 13. Here's what it says. It says, Later they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. They came to him and said, Teacher, we know you are a man of integrity, you aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me, he asked. Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. They brought the coin and he asked them, whose portrait is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. And they were amazed at him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Um, so let's start out just with a little uh, mini sermon here, Ben. Um, so in your most conversational tone possible, tell us what's going on in this passage. So we, we see the Pharisees and the Herodians come up to try to trap Jesus, as they're saying. So they're basically, contextually, what we're seeing is, so we, knew, we know that uh, Israel is underneath Roman occupation, or Jerusalem's under Roman occupation at this time, and there's this group of people, there's these zealots who really want to overthrow the Roman oppressors, and there's these Herodians who are kind of... Um, I don't know if faithful is the word, but they're at least um, copacetic with the, the Roman government. And so the Pharisees are trying to trap Jesus between these two groups of people so that they will have a reason to go after him, basically. Now, at this time, they're looking for ways to uh, discredit him or to eventually, as they wind up doing, as we all know, having him crucified or, or dealt with. So this group of these two groups of people, so by asking him this question of, is it right to pay taxes specifically to Caesar? Because we were talking about this beforehand, that um, you know they paid all kinds of taxes. Um, there's the temple tax, there's different kinds of taxes, but specifically the Roman tax, which is to pay, basically to give credit to this occupation, this Roman occupation, and say, yeah, we're okay with this, you guys can occupy us, we'll pay you taxes. Um, that would upset the, the zealots, who are trying to overthrow the, the Roman government, who are seeking a Messiah, by the way, who is going to be a 
military leader who's going to be this great leader. And so would kind of, I guess, discredit Jesus as the Messiah in their eyes. But also and it would anger them and potentially lead them to, to maybe go after Jesus. But then if he were to say, no, don't pay your taxes, then he would be in opposition to these Herodians and to the Roman authorities, which there, again, might give, him this, the, give them this opportunity to hand him over, to be arrested. And so he's caught in between, but Jesus recognizes it right away. He, he says, it says that he recognized their hypocrisy. He says, why are you trying to trap me? So immediately there, you know, Jesus <laughs> cuts right through all of it and gets to the heart. And so he says, bring me a denarius. And so looking at this coin, and he, and he gives that famous um, phrase, you know, whose image is on this? <clears throat> they say Caesar's. He says, render unto Caesar. What is Caesar's? Render unto God. What is God's? And that snippet, that specific verse is taken out of context a lot of times to mean <laughs> things that it really doesn't mean. And that's the danger with any scripture that we look at. Um, a lot of the more famous ones, you know, John 3.16, um, any of them that just kind of, they're, they're these snippets, they can kind of be taken out of context to mean what they are. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, right? Philippians 4.11. And so um, the number one rule in hermeneutics, hermeneutics is interpreting the Bible. The number one rule in that is that there's only one interpretation of the Bible. There's only one interpretation of any scripture, any text, and that is what it originally meant in its context. And so we have to dig through that before we can cross the bridge into our specific time and location and and look at um, how it applies to us. And so we look at the text, we figure out, you know, ask those questions, who, what, where, why, when, who's saying this, what were they saying, when were they saying it, where were they saying it, what was their audience, um, what were they saying to them, how would it have been taken, and then take those principles out of it and apply it to us. So when Paul is saying, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, he wrote it on the island of Patmos when he was in exile, and he's suffering all these things. And so for him to say that, he's saying, you know, to, to the, um, the church he's writing to, to say, hey, look, I'm okay with my lot. I've learned to be content with having plenty, with, having, with being in want. And so he says, Christ gives me strength to do this. We can take the principle of that is that the same Christ who gives Paul strength also gives us strength. So that's how we cross that bridge. So in this context, getting a roundabout to it, is, um, you know, Jesus is doing something really fascinating. He says that, he's, that they were amazed. And so he says, whose image is this? And by him asking that, they see that this is, it's, they say Caesar's, it's a coin with Caesar's image. And the, the question of image or iconography was important to Jews because, you know, there's uh, the mandate for them not to have any idols. And so to, to make an image of something was to basically make a mini idol of something. Um, and so they, they were forbidden to have these uh, idols or, or images, graven images. You shall not make any graven images for yourself. And so they say, this is Caesar's. And so for him to say, well, who's, it's for him to say, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, he's saying, you know, yeah, pay your taxes. But also he's saying, but render unto God what is God's. Now think back to Genesis. Whose image do we bear? We bear God's image. And so Yes, technically everything belongs to God, so we should render everything back unto him. But specifically, he's saying, render yourself unto God. Render that which is God's, that which bears his image. Render it back to him. So he's saying, you know, pay your taxes, be a good citizen, but be a better citizen of heaven. Um, and so that's kind of, they're, they're amazed. So he kind of sidesteps the question to get around this trap, um, but in the same way is saying something very profound. Um, well, let me ask you, that's interesting, because one of the things that you mentioned that we talked about a little beforehand is that it does specifically refer to Caesar, you know, that, that this isn't just, you know, paying taxes in general, but it's paying taxes to this particular governmental entity who was, you know, ruling over the Jewish people and things like that. Um, so how does that bear, or does it bear in any way, shape, or form, to our current uh climate, our current political situation. I mean, we're obviously, we're not ruled by Caesar right now. So can we take something from this passage to, uh, it, to educate us as far as our duty and obligation to pay taxes to our current government? Sure. You know, Scripture also tells us that uh, there is no authority except given by God. So every authority that we are under um, has been established because God is the God who makes kings, kingdoms rise and fall. And so we find ourselves in our own geopolitical climate of well, at least where we are, we're in the United States uh, under uh, 
<clears throat> under certain laws and certain tax regulations. And so, yeah, to submit to that in the sense that God is the ultimate authority who has, who is sovereign over every nation. And so, unless a authority is being, is directly in opposition to what God, God's authority, you know, so we have God as the head, but, you know, authorities fall underneath him. If those authorities are not falling in line with God, then there's some room for Christians to, to practice civil disobedience. There's still a right way to go about it. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, taxes, I don't think, is one of those things. <laughs> well, that, um, that's interesting because that ties together something else you mentioned earlier um, with a, a, a interpretation of this passage that mm-hmm. I read getting ready for this today. Um, you're, so you mentioned that there could be conflict between, you know, obviously our duties to the government and our duties to God. Um, well, one person that I, I read about online interpreted this uh, passage. It says, you know, Jesus said, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, clearly instructing his followers to obey the secular law, even if they have religious objections to it. And so you had mentioned, for example, that there are no authorities except those that are established by God. So given that, are we to take this render under Caesar passage to mean what this author is claiming, that you know, even if you might have some religious objections to it, you're commanded to obey the civil authorities so you obey them no matter what? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, well, I mean, you know, are they saying religious or, you know, or spiritual, you know? In today's culture, you know, they kind of get... They get so mixed up, right. and people can say, I've got a religious objection to this, no matter what. Like, you can you can make your own religion. There's a Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster. That's a real thing. Yes. Look it up. Yes, it is. <laughs> um, and so you can make that mean anything that you want it to mean. For Christians, I don't think that, that holds truth, because, you know, Scripture does have things to say about... Uh, this was specifically in reference to... Uh, making a cake for a, a gay couple, and right. so the scripture does speak to that. And um, you know, there are certain convictions that we have as as Christians, as followers who hold have a high view of God's word that we have to maintain true to that first. And this passage that they're citing in particular of rendering unto unto Caesar is a misquote or a misapplication of that scripture to say that you you have to obey civil authority regardless of. Uh, whether or not you have objections. Uh, I don't think that's not what this means. Well, I also find it gets back to what you were saying before about, you know, hermeneutics and, and proper, you know, proper biblical interpretation and taking things, it, it make sure you understand the historical, the cultural, the literary context, everything in the passage, before you try to start applying it to the, the present day. And in this case, it's even more egregious than that because uh, they this, this person has pulled out the phrase, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, but just it kind of ignores the following passage where Jesus says, render under God what's God's, you know? Precisely. <laughs> like, so, I mean, how on, on what basis, on what logical basis do you pick out, if you're going to follow this kind of interpretation, do you say, oh, so he's saying to always put the Caesar stuff first, when the very next phrase is to, you know, also render under God. So why aren't you interpreting to say to put the God stuff first, you know? Right. there's there's That's a classic example, I think, of, you know, you know, reading into the scripture as opposed to taking something out of the scripture, reading right. into it what you want to have to be there, and exactly. so we need to be be careful about that. And Jesus even makes that distinction too when he, when it comes to tithing. Um, when the Pharisees come up to him and say, you know, should we tithe? And he says, uh, uh, yes, you should tithe, but do not leave the more important things undone either. Mm-hmm. Um, so again, it's getting back to render unto God what is God's, which again everything is His. So a tithe goes uh, to Him, but. Also, the more important things, Jesus kind of places, you know, tithing kind of down here, and he says the more important things, which are taking care of the, the poor and the oppressed and um, you know, all of those other things that we should be practicing uh, as more important than specifically what is the dollar amount that I should be giving or what is the dollar amount that I should be taxing. Uh, should I even claim my tithes on my taxes, things like that. Good transition, actually, <laughs> um, because the next thing I was going to ask you about is some specific questions like that. I and mean, we were, we've got tax day coming up here uh, next week, and uh, and Christians may have some specific questions about things like that. About, I mean, 
and I think, I don't know if this is the way you were going for going towards it when we were talking about beforehand, but the dilemma that I've seen raised quite a bit is if I claim my tithes on my taxes, or even if you don't want to say, you know, use the word tithe, I know there's an issue yeah. in, you know, whatever, the money I give to the church. Right. Should I claim that as a deduction on my taxes or not? Because if I claim it as a deduction, is that somehow taking away from... Uh, my motive in in giving to the church is, is it's like I'm giving, but I'm getting something out of it. Um, is is there an issue or or whatever you want to address? This? Should Christians be claiming things like that uh, on their taxes? Yeah, well, when so a lot of times the the opposition comes and they you know when Jesus says when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand see what your right hand is doing. You know, do not do it to be seen by men, and it gets at that question of motive. What is my motive behind it? I would say, I hope not, at least nine times out of ten. Uh, I would hope that people, when they give to the church, it's not so that they can get a tax break. Um, that would be the wrong motive. And so your question isn't even when it comes to taxes. It's your question in the in the forefront of it is, well, if you're going to do that, don't even give to begin with. Um, but a majority of people, at least I like to think so, is that when you give, you're doing it out of a place of wanting to give back to God and to, to see that. Uh, to give back your gifts, your talents, um, that you can to him to see the work of the Lord done with that. Because, and that's another one of those passages where Jesus says, do not let your left hand see what your right hand is doing. That's kind of taken out of context where, um, you know, we, we see that. And so we say, you know, well, if I claim my giving on my taxes, then that's that's saying that, um, you know, I'm I'm doing it to be seen by men. Nobody give so that they so that so he can say to the government look i'm a good citizen i give to the church i don't know anybody that does that and really and those forms anyway they're um they're they're private they're you know not posted everywhere anyway and it's jesus doesn't say you can't tell anybody about it it's just don't shout it from the rooftops as the the hypocrites were doing and so because just a few verses earlier from that one jesus says you are the light of the world uh do your um let your light so shine so that you're People may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So there is a sense in which our good deeds are meant to be a witness to to God the Father who gives us the means to do those good deeds. Um, And so getting back to the the specific question of should we claim our our giving um, more accurately than just tithes, but should we claim our our giving on on our taxes? um, I'd say, you know, ultimately that's between you and the Lord. Um, Same thing with with giving. uh, Examine your heart. And the reason why you give, and that's that's between you and the Lord. Um, but I would also say I don't see anything wrong with claiming it because that is, in a sense, um, to not claim is you know claiming any deduction that is rightly available. And this is not tax fraud, but in, in going about it the right way, um, charitable donations are a legitimate deduction that the government offers. And so to use that, then brings even more income back that you can be using as a good steward um, to put in other places for the, you know, for God. I mean, God doesn't need our money, um, but he does ask us to be good stewards of all that we have been given. And so in a way, you know, claiming those deductions could be better stewardship than not claiming them. Two thoughts that occur to me here. Number one, um, you mentioned, I don't know anybody that actually, you know, gives to the church in order to take the tax deduction, that would be very counterintuitive. I mean, I'm not a tax expert, but I know at least when I do my taxes, if I if I have a $100 deduction, it doesn't mean I'm getting $100 back or $150 back, mm-hmm. you know, from the government. You're getting something less. Mm-hmm. And so you still would have been better off, if you want to call it that, you know, financially, as far as the net, your your, your bank account balance, right. had you not put the money in there. You're not, right. you're not making money off of getting these tax deductions. Right. So it doesn't seem to me there's a real strong motive. So that, to me, that's, that kind of makes it, yes, okay to, to declare these things, mm-hmm. because it's, that I would think for most people, like you said, that can't be where your heart really is, and, and that's the test. That's the, the, the what we're really looking for is where's your heart when you're when you're making these contributions. Um, and the other thing that occurred to me is what you were saying there at the end about you know the government does allow these deductions, and I'm putting on my lawyer hat here for a minute, and there's a reason for that. And I get this mm-hmm. question asked to me sometimes, um, where people object to you know churches, for example, being tax exempt mm-hmm. and. 
uh, and they, you know, they say, well, you know, and, and largely with the context it comes up in is, you know, some type of social issue that someone disagrees with a Christian teaching on, and so they want to punish the church by saying you should have your tax uh, exemption revoked, and we shouldn't have this for the churches. But you have to understand there's a reason for it. The government hasn't just handed out tax deductions and tax-exempt entities just because, oh, we like church or something like that. Um, certain things, like those of you that know my wife, Mary Kay, she she helps, you know, one part, part of her job is the food closet. It involves the food closet here at Trinity. Um, we got a really great ministry, the food closet, the food ministry here. Well, that's a classic example of why government gives tax deductions or tax exemptions to entities like churches, because the, what, if you see things like we have here in Maryland, we have the Maryland Food Bank, mm -hmm. and the food comes into the food bank. Um, but the food bank itself, uh, I'm sure my wife will correct me after we're off the air if I'm wrong, but at least generally speaking, doesn't give food directly to the people who need it. All right, They distribute the food to other people, other entities, who will then distribute to the people that need it. She's coming up to and the mic here already. here I come. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, what he's left out is that he's talking about the federal food that comes from the federal government. It goes to the Maryland Food Bank, which is, a, I believe, a nonprofit itself. But, um, and then they distribute it to churches and other nonprofits to get it into the hands of the people. But what you're talking about is not necessarily the food that's donated to the Maryland Food Bank as much as the federal... Right, because we're talking about the federal tax exemptions here and everything. Yeah. But you're talking about... But what what you're saying is that the churches are using these five uh, these charitable organizations like the Maryland Food Bank and like Trinity's Food Closet um, to distribute their their emergency food. Um, right. Because understand, if it weren't for these entities... Thank you, Mary Kay. If it weren't for... I knew you'd correct me. Uh, <laughs> if it weren't for these entities... And she should correct me. She's the one that knows more about it than I do. Um, if, if, if it weren't for these entities like churches that are engaging in this type of activity, then the federal government would have to take on that expense. Or if the state government, if we're talking about some kind of state charity, you know, the, 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 or the state exemption, the state would have to do it. And so that's the point of these exemptions, is that you have these entities that are taking on obligations, for lack of a better word, that otherwise would fall to the government to do. And so they actually save the government money and save you in taxes by having these other entities take on that obligation, take on that burden, that responsibility. Um, so that's why. I just yeah. kind of throw that one in there. Um, any last thoughts that you want to talk about about Christ and taxes? <laughs> well, I mean, kind of putting on the theologian cap here. Is, <laughs> yes, I've is, taken uh, off my lawyer hat now. So. Um, going back to what we said earlier, when, when Jesus says, uh, yes, you should, but do not leave the more important things left undone either. So if you really want to give back, and it, again, like I said, it's between you and the Lord, what you claim or don't claim on your taxes, as long as it's legal and you're doing it the right way. Um, but also, do not leave the, the more important things left undone either. So not even just giving financially, but if you can help out in a charitable organization, use your, your time and, and be able to use your services in that way. Um, I think the Lord sees all of that as well and will bless you for it. And that's, again, not the reason that we do it. <laughs> well, then you get um, the whole theological the discussion about what does it mean to be blessed, you mm -hmm. know? And, uh, let's right. start talking well, about the... the uh, act itself is, is a blessing. Yeah. But, but say, yeah. Well, you want to get into it? We can just start, you know, we're, we're already over 20 minutes, but if you want to start talking about, you know, the uh, prosperity gospel and everything and how that's taken, you know, as far as what blessing means, we can Part go into Part two. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we've talked about that before. We did yeah. an episode about that with Pastor Jay last uh, mm -hmm. June or something, I think. So go find that. Um, <laughs> well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And um, hopefully the most entertaining video you've ever watched about taxes. <laughs> um, so, hey, if you did like this video, do me a favor. Go ahead and click the like button. That's a thumbs up button right here on the YouTube page. Also, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and share this video. Share it quickly. Tax days in six days. <laughs> so if you don't share it right now, this instant is not going to get to the people in time before the tax deadline. So share it right now. Uh, <laughs> also, hey, uh, go ahead and give us a like. We do have a Facebook page here. Uh, Trinity Joppa Channel is what it's called, where we post things in there about what's coming up. Um, we post links every time we put up a new video so you can see what we've got coming. And you can give us feedback on there about what you'd like to see on this show or any of the other shows we have on the channel. So go, if you're on Facebook, give us a like there on the Trinity Joppa Channel page. Um, next week, uh, let's see. what today's. Oh, next week is going to be Holy Week.
Mm-hmm. And so we have a special episode for those of you who don't know or that maybe aren't here from go to Trinity. We at Trinity have been putting on a passion play every year but one since 1988. Um, so this is actually the okay. 31st telling of the Passion Play here at Trinity. And what we did last year, we're bringing this back, this tradition back this year, is we've invited a number of members of that Passion Play cast to come on to the show and talk not just about the play, but also what I find is participation in the play often brings out some of the the thoughts they have on this, is what does the passion mean to you? Mm. And, and so we're going to have some people come on to talk about that next week. Um, so please make sure you tune in for that, uh, about the significance of the passion. So it seemed like an appropriate Holy Week uh, subject to tackle. And this guy over here is playing Peter. I'm not going to make him commit on camera to whether he's going to be on that episode or not, because he just found out about it right before we started filming. <laughs> so, but, uh, but tune in next week to find out what Ben's answer is as far as whether he's going to come on the Passion Play episode or not. Tell you um, what, we get enough likes or shares, I'll do it. <laughs> there you go. All right. <laughs> he didn't say how many, notice. He, he's left himself some wiggle room. One's there. enough. <laughs> One's <laughs> enough. <laughs> <laughs> All right. On that note, thank you for coming on again, Ben. It's always a pleasure every time you come on. They're great episodes. <laughs> Likewise. And thank you all for watching. God bless. In your word, we will follow.